Hello and welcome to 6502 Assembly Language Programming. Um, I think this will be number 13 in the series. Um, I've created a couple of notes before I start. I created a project page on my blog where I'll have links to uh, various resources related to the project. Um, the videos, um, books on the 6502, um, in fact I just thought of another one to add. Um, do that right here while I'm thinking about it. I don't know the exact address. I'll find that later, but I'll just plug it in there so I'll remember. There's a site called Codebase64 that collects a lot of uh, a lot of assembly language code and and other stuff, so that'll be a good resource. Um, but anyway, I created that, so I'll have a link to that um, in the description for the videos from now on, so people can find the rest of them and and other stuff. Um, I also created a a GitLab repository where I'll be pushing the code to from now on so it'll be um, available that way. Um, thought we'd start a new project um, since the 10 print thing is over um, it only took one hour um, thought we'd start something new. I'm gonna do a, a little game called Worm uh, at least the, the FreeBSD version is called Worm and take a look at how it works here there, there are a few different games that all have kind of the same idea of you're you're moving around in a in a grid. Um, there's snake, there's worm, um, different ones. So we're gonna start with this one. The idea is you have you have this this uh, worm that has a head, and you steer the head around, and you're trying not to run into yourself or the sides, and there's always one number somewhere on the screen and you just steer around with the keyboard and when you run across a number it makes your worm that many pieces longer and you just keep going around of course this was originally written back in the day when the screens were probably 80 by 25 at most and I don't know what my terminal here is it's considerably bigger than that and so a game can you know can take a long time but the idea is that you gradually get shorter and shorter on space and eventually you're forced to run into yourself or you just screw up and run into yourself like this and then you end and your score is however long your worm was so it's a pretty simple little game but I thought it'll give us a chance to go over some some things about uh, programming um, algorithms and uh, 6502 hardware so We'll start an assembly language uh, file and we'll start a project file. Okay. Now, we'll have to think about some things because um, I really haven't thought too much about how to do this one. Um, So you steer, steer a worm, really you steer the head, steer the head of a worm around the screen. And the worm itself just follows you, so it's basically, the, the worm just represents the last so many spots that you were at. It doesn't move around on its own, it's just, it's sort of like your, your comet tail or however, whatever you'd say, that it just follows along and shows where you were the last so many spots. Um, We'll need to check for collisions. If the worm runs into itself or runs into the edge of the screen. Now on the FreeBSD it put or on FreeBSD that version put uh, a border of asterisks around the screen and so you check to collisions against those. I think actually that might be a good way to go. I wasn't planning on doing that. I was planning on just um, having the edge of the screen be the, the edge but there would actually there, there could actually be an advantage to having a border of um, characters that you're 
going to collide with because that way actually that does make a lot of sense it does solve some problems because if you are just using the edge of the screen then when you get to the edge of the screen because of the way the the um, Vic um, display is is laid out you're just going to go around and you know if you go out the left side you're going to come in the right side one one line higher and so you would have to you'd have to always be checking your x and y coordinates and saying you know am i if i just tried to move left am i trying to move left from the far left column and if i am then that's a collision where yeah i think i think we'll put a border around it okay and then put a number in a free in a free spot somewhere and running into the number grows your worm that many okay. and creates a new worm or creates a new number there's always a number somewhere So I'd say that's the basic concept of the game. Um, the basic ideas that we'll have to deal with. Okay. So going to our assembly language file to get started on that, I'll just copy some stuff from the last one we did. Now we could um, we could look at the C you know, because the the source is, the C source is available um, for the one that I showed you that's on FreeBSD it comes in a package called BSD Games. Um, we could look at that C source and then sort of you know try to translate piece by piece to assembly, but I think we're probably better off just starting from scratch because you don't necessarily do things the same way in assembly that you do in C, even though C gets compiled down to assembly or machine language, or however you'd put it. Um, when you're actually writing an assembly, you tend to think about things a little differently. You tend to do things a little differently, and that's one reason it's, it's more efficient, especially for these older machines when you don't have that much space to work with. Um, you, you have to just, you have to do things a little differently. Then you then you do them in a higher level language like C. So we'll just start out with um, assembly and figure things out as we go. All right. So things we need to do. First of all, we need to clear the screen. And now I'll we'll just. I think we had a clear screen. No, we didn't have a clear screen in this other. We will need a. We will need a random. Um, we will need random numbers when we put the num when we put a number on the screen somewhere. We will need random numbers for that. So let's uh, let's have a random function. Now I think if if you've been following along with this series you probably noticed that we use some of the same stuff over and over like clear the screen or set up random um, that kind of thing and so what I'm gonna do again in a higher level language I would probably just create a file and call it common you know common dot a put all my commonly used um, routines in there and then include that file in every you know in all my other programs problem with that is you know, I don't want to include anything in this particular program that I don't need. And so I don't want to just stick them all in one, you know, in one thing. So let's put set up rand in a file called randomlib.a. And then we don't ever need to look at that again. And now we need to, oh gosh, I can't think what is the, I'm 
trying to think what the um, I'm having my brains locked up for a second here I think what the command is for including another file I think it's source but that doesn't seem quite right no oh, bang source okay that particular one in a while. So bang source. Random lib dot a. Alright. So that'll pull in why well, it keeps wanting to move over. That'll pull in our random routine so that then we can call JSR setup brand. And we're not pulling in a bunch of other routines that we don't need. So we'll do clear screen the same way. I think I've got clear screen in um, in the game of whoops, yeah, in the game of life. Well, I thought I did. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just use fill screen with a space. That makes sense. Okay, so let's get fill screen. Let's put that in a file called um, text screen lib dot a. Fill the screen with a value in a. All right, and I may end up, you know, since these are going to be library files, which, which basically, but what I mean by that is this is going to be a file that's never used on its own. It's always pulled into other programs, and so generally, uh, you know, I may want to add a little more documentation to it, just to, you know, some more comments to say what it's about, how you use it. But uh, I think this one's pretty straightforward. So um, now I will have to. Now I guess I'll leave I'll leave screen as it is because that way if I move the screen around in a different program it'll still work. Um, <clears throat> so so we need a source text screen lib not a and then here. swap those for some reason okay so now we've we've set up the random registers so that we can pull random numbers later and I think yeah there's random let's get that okay so we can pull random numbers later from random and I did some reading on random numbers that's that register doesn't really give you as good a randomness as I thought, but it'll be good enough for, for our purposes so far. Um, okay, so we've set up random, we've filled the screen with spaces, which clears it. One thing I want to do is turn off the cursor, because that was something I noticed with the last program, that it, the, the display was a little funky because the cursor would appear sometimes. Um, the blinking cursor um, and so I think we want to turn that off and the way to do that is let me flip over to the manual here you've got this memory location A27 that controls the VIC, the cursor for the VIC display um, and it's called VIC cursor disable because if it's set to anything one basically um, it disables the cursor and so that's A27 <clears throat> uh, and so coming back here let's add an address for that let's 
early in the morning my hands are a little cold and I'm not typing my best yet and so we can load a with one and store that in the cursor and that should disable the cursor so that while our game is going on we don't have the cursor which we did in the in the FreeBSD version for some reason um, as you move around the cursor is actually running ahead of your or to the right of your worm head which is actually kind of obnoxious so I don't want that um, we'll keep that out of it um, another note I get something else to add to the notes here that I just thought of do we want to display a score during the game because if we do you know, then we're going to have to separate off a section of the screen to put that in, um, like the like the BSD one has the very top line on the screen show the score, and then there's a border below that. So we may add that later on. This is definitely going to be more than one video um, to do this thing, so we can add some things later on. All right. I think the first thing to do is to program just moving the head of the worm around. Um, or actually, I guess the first thing to do would be to draw the border on the screen. That's probably the simplest thing. So let's do that um, first of all. So let's write that as a subroutine and come down here and say draw border all right so now draw a border of asterisks around the screen okay so what does that mean well it means we need a border we need a line of asterisks across the top a line across the bottom and then you know fill in the left and right up and down so line across the top is going to be 40 asterisks starting at screen and so we can do that by loading one of the index registers we'll just use X load X with 40 um, then we need uh, need a marker and I'll explain the marker in a second here um, load X with 40 and then Let's see. Oh, we need to load A with the asterisk. And I don't know what the asterisk um, is. And so what I'm going to do is... I could look it up in the manual, but it would take a little time to track down the right page, and so I'll show you something here. Um, in basic... I think I showed this in a pre... <clears throat> I think I showed this in a previous one, but in basic, if you... Um, print from the peak of let's see and then it would be let's see decimal okay I've got to change that it's set to do it's set to treat the keyboard like it's a Commodore keyboard which has things like the parentheses in different places and that's going to drive me nuts when I'm not thinking in Commodore mode so we want symbolic mapping okay now things are where I expect them to be um, I think it was D4 yeah okay and then 20 go to 10 what that's gonna do is that's that's gonna peak at the location that tells you whatever key is being pressed at the moment and then I'll just go to 10 and so it's just a little program that's useful for seeing what what value a key press gives you so now when I run that it's going to show 88 88 88 88 because that's the value for no key being pressed and then if I hold down a key it changes to that key so when I press the asterisk that's 49 that tells me what uh, what it is. Now I can also, if I want the hexadecimal value, I can make it 
print hex string and then put the peak inside of that d4 and so then the the no key is 58 in hexadecimal if I hold down the asterisk it's 31 okay I'm gonna make a note about that codes um, asterisk is what did I say I already forgot 31 and then I also want the direction keys which Traditionally, are the the keys for the VI editor. So you have H goes to the left. That's one D. J goes down. That's two two. K goes up. Two five. And L goes to the right. That's two A. Okay, so those will be, and then let's also get Q so that we can quit. That's 3E. That'll give us a way out without um, just resetting the system. <clears throat> okay. Let's kill that. Alright, so those will be the key codes we have to deal with. For now, um, actually, one more. We want the code for at two e because that'll be the head of our worm. Yeah. All right, those are our key codes. So we need three one as our asterisk. Okay. I'm mixing hex and decimal here so I'll probably screw something up. Watch to catch it. Um, in fact there's one right there that needs to be hex 20 not decimal 20 to be a space. Okay so we loaded X, loaded A, we've got our loop ready to go and so then we can store A into screen minus one comma x and we've done this before where because x is going to go from 40 down to one we need to subtract one from a screen so that by the time we add the one to 40 to it we're in the right spot that's just it makes it a little easier than saying screen starts at 3ff um, it's more accurate to say no screen starts there emacs doesn't quite understand what i'm doing with this particular assembler with the bit, the bit that I'm going to explain in a little bit. Um, decrement x, uh, branch if not equal, up to that mark. Otherwise, we'll go on to the next thing. Okay. The, the deal with this little minus sign is, in this assembler at least, and I think there's others that work like it, um, instead of it, times like this when you just, when you're just doing a quick little branch up or back, you know back or forward and you don't need to be like jumping to this from other parts of the program you can use um, these marks you can use a minus to go backwards and a plus to go forwards and so when I say branch if not equals to minus that just means go back to the last minus sign the last minus label um, it saves you having to put a lot of labels everywhere because I could put like X loop here <clears throat> but then I'd have to come, you know, pretty soon I'm going to need to do another X loop somewhere, and I'd have to put, you know, I'd have to come up with it, I'd have to call it X loop 2 or X loop 3 or something like that. I did that in previous um, programs, but um, this is actually just a lot more convenient because now, you know, this just goes to that minus, and they don't need any special labels because I'm not going to jump to that line from anywhere else. All right. Now, 
that's taking care of the top line, the top 40 bytes, but we also need to do the bottom 40 bytes. And so we can do that at the same time. We just need to figure out where that line is going to start. So if we pop over here, we've got, I usually do use Perl to use to I usually use Perl to do little things like this. Um, we're going to want a hex number for this. Um, and so we want to add 1024, which is the start of screen memory, to 40 times 24, because we want to come down 24 lines and have the start of that. And or, Well, we're going to we want to start at the 25th line, and so we need to add 24 lines to the start of screen memory to find out where the 25th line starts, if that, if that makes sense. So 7Z, 7C0, and come to think of it, I had that in the last program as B line, 7C0. So let's even, let's just use that. things up. Okay. So let's store it in B line minus one comma X. Alright. So now we're writing the top line and the bottom line as we go along, saving the need to have another loop. Okay. Now we gotta do the sides. So we've got to figure out, you know, obviously this is going to require some kind of loop. We don't want to have to just find, let's see, it's going to be 23 on the left, 23 on the right. We don't want to have to just find those locations and poke them all one by one. So we're going to have some kind of loop. So 23 times sounds like the loop, you know, amount or the loop number. Okay, I think what I'll do I'm gonna I'm gonna set up an address location called temp adra, which I'll put at FA. That's in zero page. Because <clears throat> it needs to be for what I'm gonna use it for. And what I can do is I can put an address in that location and then use that as an index for or a, or a pointer let's let's call it i can use that as a pointer for the location that we're working on as we go through the screen kind of did this with with the last program it's going to work a little differently here but um let's get started on that so if we think about where the first one is going to need to be um Let's see. They yeah, actually let's because of the way the lines wrap around the screen, the last character on line one is followed by the first character on line two. So if you think about how it's laid out in memory, we're actually getting you know, when we play like say come down to line three, when we put an asterisk on the far right end of line three the next one is going to be the first one on line four and those two are right after each other in memory so yeah so that makes sense um, so if we look at it that way if we start with the far end of line one even though we've already printed that one we can print it again and then print the very next one which is going to be the first one of line two So, what I want then is to start my pointer at the far end of line one. And that's going to be, let's see, yeah, that's going to be four, 400 plus 
two seven. So it'll be four two seven. So two seven will be the low byte. That's in hexadecimal. Because that's one less than forty. That's the thirty-nine in uh, in decimal. I'm gonna store that into temp address. Load A with four. Store that temp address one. Temp address plus one. So now we've set up a pointer in zero page at temp address, pointing to the last character of line one. And then I'm going to change this to 24 because I'm going to want to do this 24 times actually. And so the first time, well, or each time, what we want to do then, let's also, now we've got to load A with, actually, think here, stop and think for a second. Yeah, I don't want to use A for my character this time because I'm going to need to use A to do the math on this temp address as we move it across the screen. So let's load Y, since we're not using Y for anything else. Let's load Y with the asterisk value, which is 31. Okay, and then we can store Y into the location. No, wait a second, we are going to need Y, darn it. Y needs to be zero because this particular form of addressing is uh, indexed on Y, and so Y needs to stay zero. Hmm. Okay, well, we'll just have to deal with it. And A then needs to be the asterisk. Oops. Yeah, okay. So then our loop actually starts here. We're going to store A into the address pointed to by temp address, comma Y. And then we're also going to increment Y because remember, we, we, that's the one on the far right. Now we want to increment it by one so that we can do the one on the far left. That's well, increment y, sorry, and then store a into temp adra index by y again because now that's going to be one address further on. Okay. Now we need to move temp adra up by 40. We need to add 40 to the pointer at temp adra. Which means we need to do we need to do that math in the accumulator. That's the only place you can do any math, really. Um, and so we're going to have to push a. Is that the mnemonic for pushing? It doesn't look right. Well, we'll find out if it's not. Um, so we're going to push a on the stack. We haven't done much stack stack stuff lately. We haven't needed to, but we're going to push A on the stack, and now we're going to add 40 to temp address, and that's fairly simple. You load A from temp address, the low the low byte of it, and then here let's put a let's put a comment here. Add 40 to temp address pointer. So we know what we're doing here. You load A from temp address, clear the carry, add carry, or add with carry, 40, store that back in temp address. Then you load A from temp address plus one, which is the high byte of temp address, add with carry zero, and now you're pulling in the carry bit. If there was a if if the first add caused a carry, then you're going to add that carry in along with zero and store that back into temp address plus one. And that might even that might even be something that I want to put off into a separate um, subroutine at some point 
just a, a, an add sub, you know, like add something to this address um, routine, that might be a good idea. But we'll we'll see about that. And then we're done with we're done adding, and so then we can pull A back off the stack. All right. So then we should be able to, since X is our, let's see, X is our, yeah, X is our loop. So here's the start of our loop. And so then we can decrement X, branch if not equal, back up to there. And again, to, just to go back over it, these these particular marks are always to the nearest one and so this branch if not equal goes to this minus sign not this one because it's the closest one and this branch if not equal goes up to this one minus signs always go backwards if you need to branch forward you use a plus sign so that's how it that's how this one knows it's branching back up to this minus not forward to this minus okay so that's our loop which prints asterisks on the screen and in a border and since that's a subroutine we need a return at the end of it it's I feel like I'm forgetting something there but uh, I guess we'll find out and then we'll return at the end of our function here so or at the end at the end of the main part of the program so let's see if that will all um, assemble it does. Okay. Load worm zero. Cannot open worm. Where am I? Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Okay. Um, Worm zero. All right, loading it at thirteen hundred. So there's our code. You know, there's our machine code to match our assembly. <clears throat> and there's already quite a bit of it because we, you know we pulled in a couple of subroutines that we'd already written for other programs and so on. But that's that's how it looks now. Um, and we'll go to thirteen hundred. Oh. Yeah, it's gonna when it breaks at the end, it's gonna push the screen up. But it looks it looks like it worked, except that we don't have an asterisk; we have a one. So that's interesting. That may be because it, it may be a difference between the keyboards. Um, actually, I should have known thirty one. I, I should have known three one is a one um, anyway. But. Um, Let's um, let's put a little thing in here. Key press. I said key press is at D four. Okay. Let's put something at the end here to say wait for Q. And this is basically just going to be for debugging. I just want to be able to. <clears throat> I don't want the the program to finish until I tell it to finish, so that I can see how the screen looks before it breaks out. And so to do that, <clears throat> we will um, load a from um, key press compare to. What did I say? Q was Q was three E. That doesn't sound right either. That would be a number. Actually, let's make this wait for key. That makes more sense. 
compare to 88 because that's the not pressed value branch if equal back up to here and then I'll put a dash in there and then if it does if it doesn't equal which means a key has been pressed then return okay uh, value not defined wait for oh got to put a label here to start it Okay. And actually, in that case, I don't need the minus because I'm, I'm branching back up to wait for key anyway. Could do it either way there, I guess. It doesn't matter. But, um, yeah, we got ones around it. But that's not an asterisk, so let's... Um, figure that out. I'm going to have to check the manual after all. I don't know whereabouts that stuff is. Let's see. Let's go back to page 7, which is the... Uh, it's in the appendices. Somewhere. D or E. Yeah, here we are. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. That was stupid of me. Key presses, I, I even explained this in the last video, the key press codes do not match the screen codes um, because the key press codes have to do with the way the, the grid that the keyboard is laid out in and how how it gets the values from that um, and so the the operating system has to actually convert key codes to screen codes all the time um, so what we actually want is a screen code for an asterisk not the key code we only care about the key codes when we're checking key presses so the asterisk is find it here I think that's supposed to be it at 42. It's not very clear, but that's I don't see one anywhere else. 42. Okay. And 42 is going to be um, 3A in hex. Symbol. Colon. What am I doing wrong? Am I getting my... No, not 3A, 2A, dummy. 2A, because 32 for the 2, and then 10 for the A adds up to 42. Gee whiz. It really is too early. Um, okay, there's our border of asterisks, finally. <clears throat> All right, so if we look at our file here, we've got, we've got our border done. Um, All right, now we need to put the head of the worm on the screen and then be able to steer it around. Let's, uh, the asterisk code I said it was 2A. Yeah, and the, the head of the worm, the at sign is actually 0. So we'll check that, but I believe that's correct. Yes. Okay. That's probably why it was used traditionally. It probably could. <clears throat>
probably just because it was the first value in the set. You could use any character, but it's as good a one as any, I guess. Um, okay, and we don't care about screen codes of these other things. Just the key codes. All right. So when you put the thing on the screen, we put the head of the worm on the screen and move it around. The question then is, how do we want to keep track of its location? Because it has, a, it has two locations in a sense. It has an X and Y location, you know, that you think of when you're looking at the screen. That okay, it's you know, it's in this column in this row. But it also has a location in memory, which is just a you know one continuous string of bytes from 400 up to seven something something, seven um, D something I think. Um, basically, you know, t a thousand bytes in memory that are just in a row, and so it has a location in that memory. So the question is, do we need to keep track of both, and or do we need which one do we want to keep track of and then have to convert to the other one or do we need to do that now without a border you would need to, you would need to know your x and y because you would need to say okay if if i move to the left and y is or x is 0 that's a collision with the side and i need to dot you know i need to kill my worm and so you would need to know the x and the y I don't think we really need to know the x and the y with a border because we're going to we're going to figure collisions based on what's in the spot that you just tried to move to and I don't think we're going to need to keep track of the x and y for that the, the the thing is if if you do it all based on x and y then you've got to convert to memory you've got to you've got to do the math to convert that to the memory location to see what's at the memory location or to put the thing at the memory location and that math is not terrible complicated but it, it does take up cycles because you you have to do a multiply by 40 every time to um, you know figure that out you've got to multiply by 40 times the line number plus the number that you're coming over basically 40 times y plus x every time added to the, the beginning of screen screen memory and so that's a bit of math that has to be done all the time if you're always converting from x and y to the memory location if we don't have to deal with the x and y if we can just do it all based on memory locations then we shouldn't have to do any multiplication and if you think about it moves if you move left that's just subtracting one in memory because again they're all laid out all, all the screen locations are laid out in memory um, starting at the top left going across the first line and then continuing on the second line third line and so on so anytime you move left you're just moving one up one in memory right you, you know you're moving you're adding one now if you move up you subtract 40 because moving up one line moves you back 40 memory locations and down adds 40 so those will be our four moves and that's really all they need to do they don't need to do any math or they don't need to do any multiplying and they don't need to know where they are on the screen x and y you know in terms of x and y they just need to know if I'm going up I subtract 40. If I'm going down, I add 40, and so on. So I think we can, you know, we can work with that as far as our moves go. And so then that means we only need to keep track of one thing, which is the the memory location of the head of our worm as he moves around the screen. So I'm going to chain. Let's see. Am I going to need this anymore? I'm going to change temp adra to head adra, and because that's going to be more representative of how we're actually going to use it, even though down here we used it for something else. But 
we're done with it now, so actually let's just do this. Okay. So this this zero page location at head adger is gonna be our pointer in the screen memory still, except it's gonna you know now we're gonna use it as the pointer for our head, the head of our uh, worm. Down here, we just we used it as a pointer to draw the border, but we only had to do that once, so that's fine. Um, all right, so we've got to start the worm somewhere. So let's let's uh, let's place the worm, and Just to keep things simple, let's place him at 600. So a load A with a zero, store that into head address. Load A with six, and store that into head address plus one. So now that's going to make our starting location 600 and that's going to be near the middle of the screen not perfectly but somewhere in the middle of the screen hopefully it won't be on a border if it is we'll, we'll move it and we need to load y with zero because we're going to be doing indexed address uh, indirect indexed addressing here and so the y has to be involved and then load a with zero because that's going to be the the character for our worm the screen code for it for the head and store that into head adra comma y again you, you have to have the comma y there is no there is no unindexed indirect address method like this not there actually is but it's only for the jump routine it's not for anything else Okay, so we'll store that there, and so that will put the head of the worm on the screen at head address at that starting location. So let's see if that all works and just make sure it's not landing on a border. Okay, it doesn't seem to have appeared unless it's on a border and I'm just not seeing it. Did I load? Actually, not sure if I loaded my program. Doesn't look like I did. Okay, there it is. All right, so it's it's on the screen. We can center it more later if we want to. Okay, so we've we've placed the worm on the screen. Now, we want to go into a loop where we watch for key presses and move the head if you know if we tell it to move okay so we'll call this main loop because this is where we're going to do most of our you know this is where most of the game will take place um, wait for a key press and do it isn't that uh, profound um, Yes, so we can call wait for key here, since we already have that written, and it'll put the key in, so this won't be for debugging anymore. Because it's going to wait for a key press, put it in the accumulator, and then we'll have it when we come back here. So wait for a key. All right, now we've got to we've got to figure out what key is this what is you know what are we telling it to do and so we've got to start comparing it to the possible key presses that move the head around okay so let's see let me match these up left is h right is l well i've got them up here i guess Let's 
let's uh, let's make this a table. This isn't an org mode video, but you're getting a little org mode here. Okay, there are all our moves and the screen codes to go with them, and the character that does it, and so on. So if we want to compare to left, first of all, let's say, that's 1D. So we'll compare that to 1D. That's, that's the character for, that's the, the code for H, which means we want to move left. And branch if not equal ahead. Okay, we don't know what's going to be ahead yet, but we just know we don't want to do what's coming right now unless this was an H. If it was an H, then the question is what do we want to do? We want to add, or we want, we want to subtract one from head address, don't we? Okay. So to do that, let's see. I'm just I'm trying to think if there's a way to to split this off into another. There really isn't without getting into signed arithmetic, which yeah, that's that would be ugly. Um, yeah, let's just do it. Subtract one from head address. So to do that, we load A from head address. You know, actually, I think I'd better I'd better push the accumulator first because, well, actually, no, I don't need to because we're branching past that. I don't think I need to. Load A from head address, clear the carry, um, add with carry one, or no, sorry, no, don't clear the carry, set carry, because we're going to subtract. Anytime you subtract, you want to start out with the carry set so that it has something to pull the carry from. It, it really should be called a borrow flag. I think I've mentioned that before, but when you're subtracting, it's really a borrow flag, not a carry flag, but it's the same flag for both things. So, subtract with, from carry a 1, store that back into head adra, getting tired of typing capital letters, um, and then load A from head adra plus 1, subtract 0, and store that back into head adra plus 1. We've subtracted one, and so now we need to, well, let's see. Print head, let's call it. Now we need a routine for print head because we're going to print a new head regardless of which direction we moved, so I don't want to duplicate that code four times. The, the subtraction code, the subtraction or adding code, I think we'll have to just have each time, but print head can be load A with, well, actually that is going to, we need to push A at the beginning of this because we're going to have to get A back We've only compared it once. We need to compare it to several things. And so we're going to push A so that we can get it back at the end of this routine. And then 
load a with the character for the head which is zero store that into head adra which I'm really tired of typing pull a back and then return Okay, so we stored the key press on the stack while we used it here. And I, I think that's going to be necessary, although we could, could use one of the other registers instead, but yeah, in fact, let's do that. Let's load Y and store Y there. because I'm not using Y anywhere up here in this business and so we can just use that. Alright, and that actually makes print head seem a little bit of overkill maybe to jump down here because this jump subroutine print head, that's three bytes. This is two and then two and one this is five bytes and so if I just put these and and that's including the return so these two lines are four bytes I could just put these four bytes in each each of these things up here that would be 16 total after I do it four times or I can have three bytes here four times which would be 12 plus these down here it would actually be less fewer bytes to just put this up here. So let's just do that. Plus it's a little faster that way because it's faster not to jump off to another subroutine and have because every time you do a JSR or jump to subroutine the processor handles putting the program counter on the stack for you so that it can return back to that. And so there is some uh, there is some uh, overhead in every jump to subroutine call. Some stack manipulation that goes on under the hood. Alright, so that is the business that has to happen for an H to work, to move left. Now I'm not dealing with the collisions yet, we'll just get the movement part handled first and then we'll deal with the collisions. Um, Okay, and then that's to a, to a plus, because that's where we're going to branch to. If it wasn't an H, we'll branch down here, and then we can, can compare to the next thing. Alright. And so we get down here, we compare to, and that's going to be 2A for an L. That's going to mean to move right. And so I'm just going to copy this. And this time we're going to add one to head adder, which means here we want to clear the carry. Add with carry. Store it back. Add with carry. Store it back. And then the same thing with L with with Y to get her to get a new head at the new head address. Okay, I think that seems right. Okay. So now I'm just gonna copy that two more times. Now this one we'll say this is up, so we need to compare to twenty-five. 5 and hexadecimal. It's going to be K for up. Alright, now this time we want to subtract 40 from head adra. Uh, set the carry because we're subtracting. Subtract 40, which if I put it in hexadecimal, I, 
I should just use one or the other all the time because that always ends up causing problem not always but it sometimes ends up causing problems subtract the zero for the high byte and then load and then write it okay add 40 for this last one this one will be to 2 to go down and that's a J down so you want to add 40 which is hexadecimal 28 okay and then when we get down here let's do one more compare to Q that's 3 E and that will be our quit okay and so that is going to branch if equal or no let's see stop and think yeah that can branch if equal forward and now we can get rid of this wait for key and that can branch forward to there otherwise if, if none of these things happened or let's see that's gonna that one branches to there so each each branch if it doesn't match comes down to the next one and if none of them have if none of those branches happened then we're going to jump back up to main loop okay we just added a lot of stuff without testing it so let's okay, assemble load worm alright I got quite a bit longer there okay now I've got to come over to the screen now if I push H it should move to the left and it broke <laughs> okay uh, so why did it break check out our stuff here and it broke with the accumulator holding 3e which is that's the value for Q that's interesting why would I have gotten the why would I have gotten the value for Q when I pressed H Hmm. Let's try that again with a different. I'll press L. Oops, wrong, wrong screen. Okay, I pressed L. Nothing happened. Let's try K. The K also broke out with three E. Hmm. That's curious. I wonder if I have one of my usual hex versus decimal issues going on here or if it's something else. Um, over an hour here so probably won't go too much longer but let's take a stab at figuring this out let's start it one more time here okay now I'm gonna press or actually before I do anything let's look at head address okay that's pointing to 600 now I'll come over here and press L once And now let's check head Adra. Still six, still six hundred. 
Um, yeah. Now let's press K. It broke out. Well, that's interesting. And it changed. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh... Yeah, something, something wacky's happening here. Um... Something's wrong with my logic. I'm doing the wait for key, comparing that, and then branching ahead if it's not equal to that, and then comparing it to the next thing, branching ahead if it's not equal to that, comparing it to the next thing, branching ahead. And then compare the next thing, branching ahead. That should all be okay, I believe. Somehow I'm getting 3E into the accumulator, and I'm not pressing Q, so how is that getting in there? right there at 13.1 E. Let's put a break at 13.2.1 right after it. Okay, so it should break out as soon as I press a key, and it did, okay. And it has 2A, which is an L, alright. Now let's start stepping through. Compared it to 1D, branched ahead because that's not what it is. Compared it to 2A, and then that's it should do that. And so it loads A from with head adra, clears the carry, adds one to it, stores it back, loads it with FB, blah 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 blah. Oh 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 oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The problem is, or a problem is, I don't know if it's the whole problem, but once I've once I've compared and found that yes, this is an L, and I do the stuff and get to here. I don't want to compare to the other keys anymore because I've clobbered A and I know it can't be any other keys anyway because I've already found that it was this key and I've clobbered A so it could accidentally match something else based on whatever I was doing with A and so I don't want that. So what I need to do is at the end of each of these comparison sections I need to jump back up to main loop because I'm done with the loop for that, you know, for that particular key. So I'll put that there, and there, and there. So each 
each key comparison. You know, this is one area where, like, if you're writing in C or something, you would just you do this as a as a switch statement, and then each each item in the switch statement ends with a break. And that's kind of what I'm doing here. Is I'm putting a I'm putting something at the end of each at each case to say, okay, now go back and and check the next key because we've already handled this key. All right. <clears throat> So delete that uh, symbol. The worm. Throw. Okay, come over here. Press L. I don't think it moved. Press K. I don't think it moved. J H Q. Okay. Well, Q works at least. <laughs> All right. So why is the head of the worm not moving? I'm up to an hour and a quarter, but I'm curious. I want to. I'd like to figure this out while I'm thinking about it. Um, before a week goes by, my memory gets hazy. Uh, okay, so let's look at the code. Let's look at what our head address is now. Well, it's E1. That is not correct. Something funky happened to our um, head address value. Let's uh, start over and just do one. I just pressed L. So that L means one to the right, so head address now should be. 601 if it's working whoops FB it didn't change okay why didn't it change well let's look at our code here load a from head adra clear the carry add one store it back oh yeah Yeah, I can't do that. I can't use. I can't use what what I'm doing here when I store Y into head address. I'm clobbering that address. I'm not storing in the. I'm clobbering the pointer instead of storing at the memory location pointed to by the pointer. And that's why I needed my print head routine that I decided I didn't need. Print head. I am going to need that because we need to store a print new head and pull a. So we need to push a on the stack, load a with the value for our head, the, the screen code for it, store that into head addra. Ad comma y and let's load y with zero here too even though I'm not gonna mess with y but let's just make sure that y is zero each time we do this and then pull a back and return all right that's gonna have to replace each of these little bits jump subroutine printhead Because you can't, yeah. I was, I was just, I was writing over the pointer instead of writing to the address pointed to by the pointer, which was rather dumb. So this is what we want to do. We want to do this indirect thing with the parentheses to say we're we're writing to the address pointed to by head address plus y, and since y is zero, we're just writing to the address pointed to by head address. Okay. Press an L, and all sorts of crap happened. Wow. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. Um, hmm. That's interesting. Now I wonder... One thing I'm wondering about is the speed of this. When I press L, it may be doing a whole bunch of L's really fast. Um, that might be an issue. There's a, one quick way to find out. Load A from key press, compare if 88 or compared to 88 branch if not equal up to that or well, let's see branch if not equal up to here so that will keep happening no wait a second I can't do that that won't work Um, let's do it this way. Okay, so at this point we have our key, but my finger could still be holding the key down, right? So we want to wait until I've let up on the key and then move on. So let's save the key on the stack and then we'll have another loop that waits for it to go back to 88 meaning I've let up on the key and that will go right there And so that will keep looping until it comes back to 88. And then we'll pull A back off the stack and return. Okay. So now we have a wait for key press function or routine. I shouldn't call them functions, but we have a, a wait for key press subroutine, which doesn't return the key until we've until on key up, basically, and on key release. Um, so assemble now we're stuck ran into something ran into something bad in memory let's see did we yeah we still have it in memory okay alright press L there that was the problem when I pressed L it was probably getting like 200 L's and so it was running on out of screen memory and into the woods and over all sorts of other things alright so L works now we're not getting rid of the, the the back end of the worm yet we're not dealing with that K works um, H H H H J J J J L L L L now, you know, it's not going to care. You know, we're not we're not checking for collisions yet or anything like that. Um, and so it's able to go through the borders. You know. Now that and and that's a problem. You know, that's not going to be a problem once we deal with the collisions. But um, like right there, I just ran out of screen memory and who knows what, and it's you know I'm probably about to crash it. Um, or maybe I can get yes, yeah, I came back into screen memory so. So right now it can run across itself and through the border and everything. So the next thing we're going to have to do is figure out the collisions. Um, and I'm really not thrilled about this solution on the key press thing because when you actually play this game, you're going to want to be able to hold a key down and go along without having to go H, 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 you know, without having to press the key over and over and over. So we're going to have to come up with a better solution on the key press thing um, that can get you know that, that can allow you to just hold a key down without getting five thousand keys all at once um, so we'll deal with that um, and 
figure out the collisions thing and then work on how do we get the tail of the worm to disappear at the right time um, and then we've got to put a number on the screen so we got a lot of a lot of stuff still to do but we've got our basic movement um, worked out and uh, we're on the way so um, hope this has been interesting and uh, thank you for watching and we'll be back next week with another one and continuing on with this program.